This is the new 2023 Nissan Z, and it's the return of a legend, the Nissan Z car, which has been a staple in Nissan's high-performance lineup going back decades, more than 50 years, to the late 1960s, early 1970s. Well, now it's back, the all-new Z, and today I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website with free listings for sellers. You can list your car for free and pay no fees and auction it on Cars and Bids. And we've had some great sales recently, including this Mazda Miata 30th Anniversary Edition sold for just under $37,000. This fantastic 2013 Toyota Land Cruiser brought just under $50,000, and this wonderful Mercedes Mercedes AMG GTR sold for over $162,000. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it, with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. So let's talk Nissan Z. Like I said, this car has been a fixture in Nissan's performance lineup going back years, decades even, although it sort of comes and goes. Sometimes a Z model will go away or be canceled and it'll be years before a replacement emerges. This one follows up on the 370Z, which went out of production a few years ago, but now it's back and it's mostly new. And on paper, it's pretty appealing. Under the hood is a twin turbo V6 that makes 400 horsepower, and it's mated to a six-speed manual transmission, although a nine-speed automatic is also available. And these are only offered in rear-wheel drive. Those are some of the makings of a great sports car. So today, I'm gonna review the new Z and find out just how great it really is. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the new Z and show you its quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the crooks and features, the new Nissan Z, with one important detail about the new Z, and that would be that it shares its platform with the old 370Z. Now, I mention this because Toyota has told us that it doesn't make financial sense to develop a sports car by yourself, which is why they used BMW as a partner for the new Supra. Well, Nissan has done that, but they've done it in part by sharing the platform with the outgoing model, which came out back in 2009. So you get kind of an old platform here for the new Z. But while the new Z shares its platform with the outgoing model, virtually everything else is changed compared to the old 370Z, including the engine. Gone is Nissan's beloved naturally aspirated V6. NA engines are just too hard to get past fuel economy and emissions regulations anymore. But instead, we have something pretty special under here. This is a twin-turbo 3-liter V6 that makes 400 horsepower and 350 50 pound-feet of torque, and it's standard in all new Z models. Is it like the Supra, where there's a base model with a smaller four-cylinder, whatever? All Zs are getting this 400-horse twin-turbo V6. Now, 400 horsepower is a pretty healthy number, and in fact, it's about 50 to 70 horsepower more than the outgoing 370Z model, depending on which version of the outgoing model you got. So, a big, healthy power boost here. Now, this engine is shared in the Nissan world. It's shared with the Infiniti Q50 and Q. 60 Red Sport models. They also have this same powertrain, but one key difference is those vehicles are offered with rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. The Z is going to be rear-wheel drive only, just like you might expect from a sports car. And the Z is offered, like I said, six-speed manual transmission or a nine-speed automatic, so you can get it either way. You can still get your Z with three pedals. But beyond the powertrain being new for the Z, the exterior styling is also completely new. Every panel changed, the entire outside different, and in my opinion, very attractive. I think the new Z looks great, elegant, relatively simple, without some extra unnecessary visual drama like some new cars have. This one is simple, restrained, basic, and frankly beautiful. It looks like a very attractive sports car. And the outside of this car is filled with heritage design details from prior Z models. In the front, you primarily have the original Z, the old school Datsun 240Z, which you can see in a few places up 
here. For one, Nissan tells me the headlights. There was a certain version of the 240Z that had like a glass cover over the headlights, and that caused the headlights to kind of look like they were being split into an oval shape, which is what Nissan tried to go for here with the running lights, as you can see, in kind of an oval above and below shape, which is kind of an interesting throwback. You also have a Y shape on the hood. You can see this line turns into two lines, making a Y as sort of a power bulge on the hood, which is also a throwback to the original 240Z. But the most obvious original 240Z design detail up here is the front grille, a large rectangular piece, just like a lot of early Z models had. This one carries on the tradition as well. Now, when the prototype version of this new Z was revealed a few years ago, that front end design was just a big black grille, and it got some harsh criticism. So Nissan toned it down. You can see these little silver kind of rectangles within the grill, they're meant to make this big grill look a little less severe, and kind of tone down the visual impact of having a big black rectangle in front of the car. But the overall design of this grill is a retro throwback to the 240Z. But anyway, next up, moving on to the side of this car, some other exterior design touches worth pointing out, one of which is the door handle. You can see kind of a vertical, upright, and very distinctive door handle. This is a throwback to a different Nissan Z model, and that would be the Z33 version, which debuted back in 2003. It also had a very distinctive vertical door handle, and we're seeing that carried over to this version as well, a retro throwback to something from the early 2000s. Also interesting on the side of this car, you can see a two-tone design. The body is obviously blue, but the roof is black. These are going to be offered as full body color, or you can opt for this two-tone design, although if you do, the roof part is always black. There's no other colors you can deviate the roof. You will also see this large chrome trim going down the side right below the roof. The entire side of the car has it. Looks cool, adds some visual excitement, but it kind of disappears near the end of the car and creates sort of a weird situation back here where the black two-tone part meets the blue paint part, and they don't really have a defined separation on the tailgate lid. It feels like kind of an unfinished design detail on this car. Also unusual on the outside of the new Z is the fuel door, which is absolutely massive. You can see it here. Nissan told me the designers were actually kind of proud of getting this fuel door to have several different surface creases and made it work, but I just think it's massive, maybe unnecessarily large, and frankly, it looks a little weird. But those are minor design details that look a little strange in an overall car that I really do think looks great. But anyway, next we move around to the back of the new Z, and you'll see yet another design detail borrowed from yet another different Nissan Z car, and that would be the taillights. You can see these sort of horizontal lines back here, a very distinctive taillight look, and that's borrowed from the Z32 Nissan 300ZX from the mid-90s. You can see the Z32's taillights here, also these horizontal lines, and they've brought it back for this new Z car, and again, very distinctive. Now, the way these operate are interesting. When you turn on the headlights, the taillights light up as these large vertical ovals inside the taillight assembly. When you put on the brake lights, they turn on inside the large vertical ovals, which looks kind of cool, and the turn signal is bright orange and below all of that, just sort of a flat vertical piece at the base of this taillight assembly. Now, interestingly, the little red ovals on the inside of the taillight assembly don't do anything. These are just reflectors. They don't really have a purpose. They don't light up, but they do help kind of further the look of this overall taillight, kind of mimicking what you had in the Z32. Now, another notable item back here is the rear spoiler. You will see it here, and that's because this is a Z performance model. There are going to be two trims of the new Z. The base model is called the Z Sport, and the upgraded model, this one, is called the Z Performance. The Z Sport will start right at $40,000 before shipping, so maybe around forty-one dollars after shipping. The Z Performance, this model, will start right at $50,000 before shipping, so like fifty-one dollars with destination included. And there are some upgrades to the Z Performance on the outside. One is the rear spoiler, which the base model doesn't have. You can see an unspoilered sport model here. You also have a front spoiler that's included in the Z Performance. Well, it's not included in this particular car, so we can get on and off trucks for transport more easily, but it will be included in the Performance. The Performance also comes with 19-inch wheels. You can see here, these are the standard wheels in the Z Performance, whereas the Sport comes with 18-inch wheels, as you can see right here, different wheel design and smaller wheels overall. And fitting behind those wheels, the Z Performance has larger brakes. Not much larger, but about an inch bigger in front and a little less than that in back, so a little larger brakes in the Performance for a little better stopping power. But anyway, back to the rear of this car. A couple things worth noting back here. This rear diffuser, this is on all 
all models, the sport and the performance, and it looks good and sporty and exciting, and it includes the dual exhaust, as you can see. And in fact, you can even see these little holes on the rim of the exhaust, which looks cool. That's borrowed from the Q60 and Q50 Red Sport. They have the same exhaust tips. Unfortunately, this powertrain doesn't quite sound as good as the old naturally aspirated engine. Take a listen. Now, another notable item back here is badging. You can see Z is printed on the back of this car, and that is, in fact, its name. There was some speculation Nissan was going to call it the 400Z, and the prior one was the 370Z, the 350Z, the 300ZX. Well, that's all gone. The numbers are gone. It's just Z. That's what they're calling it. That's what the badge says, and that is its only name. One other thing worth pointing out with the badge, every previous Z has had sort of a distinctive Z font. This car doesn't. Instead, Instead, it uses the original font from the original 240Z, so kind of a heritage font in here. One other heritage item in the back, you can see subtly printed at the bottom of the rear glass, the words since 1969. That's there because the Z originally went into production in late 1969 as a 1970 model, and this car carries forward the tradition, hence this little kind of Easter egg written into the bottom of the glass that you may not notice except that I pointed it out to you. Now, also worth pointing out about this rear glass situation is the way that it opens, which is kind of clever. You don't have some ugly trunk popper. Instead, you reach into the bottom half of the Nissan logo, as you can see here. You reach in, press it, and then it pops open, and you can open it the rest of the way from there, which would be exceptionally cool, a neat way to clean up the rear of the car, except for the fact that you do have a backup camera sticking out here next to the Nissan logo. So they could have integrated that into the Nissan logo, but instead they did the trunk popper. Either way, something had to stick out, which is kind of unfortunate. But when you open up the tailgate in the new Z, you can see the cargo area, and there's really nothing of note back here. It's pretty much just a cargo area, nothing weird, interesting, exciting. You do have a big crossbar going directly behind the seats. Obviously, that's for increased rigidity and better handling and track performance, but otherwise, it's pretty much just a cargo area, and Nissan tells me that cargo space is unchanged from the outgoing 370Z. Now, one thing you can notice from back here is the fact that this car only has two seats, which has been pretty standard fare in Nissan Z models for years now, but some prior Zs did have back seats. Well, this one doesn't. But you do have a little bit of storage behind the front seats, as you can see here, for a little added practicality if there's some stuff that won't fit in your cargo area. But anyway, next up we climb inside the new Z, and one of the things you'll notice if you're familiar with the prior model is there's kind of an interesting mix of new and old in here. There's some carryover pieces in this interior that come straight out of the old car. For example, the parking brake is borrowed from the old car. Same with the center switch gear, these heated seat buttons and this tailgate button, as you can see. Also, the climate controls come out of the old car. These circle climate controls with buttons in the center, they're lifted straight out of the old 370Z model, and Z enthusiasts will note that. Same deal with the stocks coming off the steering column, turn signal and wiper stock borrowed straight from the old Z, and same deal with the switch gear on the door panel. The power windows, the mirrors, the lock button, all that stuff is off the old Z. In fact, Nissan tells me that the door panel in general is pretty much lifted entirely from the old Z, although it has some new trim in the center. This material in here is a little bit different from what you had in the old car, a little bit nicer and classier. But you will see the same door handle and the same door-mounted climate control vent, just like you had in the old 370Z models. Now, this might be disappointing to some enthusiasts who aren't happy to see some carryover material switches and other items in this interior from the old Z, which was already getting criticism for being pretty outdated, and now its stuff continues on. But it's important to point out again that this carryover is part of what allowed Nissan to develop this car and kind of lower the costs and make it financially feasible to create a new Z. And it's also worth pointing out there is a good bit of new stuff in this interior. For example, the steering wheel is completely new, unique to this car, not used in other Nissan models, and totally new for the Z. You can see it has a lot of different steering wheel controls on both spokes next to the driver's thumbs. Very easy to use, and Nissan told me inspired by the steering wheel in the original R32 Nissan Skyline GTR. Now, directly above the steering wheel, you can see a gauge cluster screen, which is shared with other Nissan models, but new for the Z, and it has some pretty cool features. For one thing, full color, 
very high resolution. It's a good gauge cluster display system, and it's quite configurable. You can change the center panel to show you all sorts of different things from vehicle information to music information to navigation stuff. There's a lot of good info on the screen, and you can see it in various different ways. And I especially like how you can change this gauge cluster screen to show slightly different display modes. This is the standard mode, or it looks like a fairly normal gauge cluster, but you can also put it in an enhanced mode, and then your speed and engine speed kind of get small, and they're pushed over to the side, so whatever your center display screen shows can be maximized, which is kind of cool. Cooler still, though, is the sport mode for this gauge cluster. You go into sport mode, and then you can see it here, and now it focuses on gauges. You have your tachometer in the center and other gauges on the side, and the configurable part becomes the screen on the left, which now shows like sport and performance data. You can't see your music information here, your phone, your navigation, but you have G-forces and other performance information on this screen, all of which is pretty cool. One drawback I will point out, though, about this screen, you can't see a full screen navigation map unless you're actively navigating somewhere. So you can't just have the map showing up on this screen unless it's taking you to a direction, which I find to be kind of disappointing. Now, something very interesting about this car, I just showed you the gauge cluster screen and its different modes, and usually in most cars, the gauge screen changes are linked to drive modes. But in this new Z, if you get the manual transmission, there are no drive modes. And that means no sport mode, no eco mode, no comfort mode. You can't choose between any of that. You can if you get the automatic transmission. But if you choose the manual, Nissan says they feel they've equipped it in a sporty way. And so you can't change drive modes, which is unusual. I can't remember the last modern performance car I got into that didn't let you switch drive modes. But this one does kind of an interesting play from Nissan. You do have one button next to the gear lever that says S mode with kind of a picture of a gear pattern on it. That doesn't actually change the modes, but instead it turns on the automatic rev matching downshift feature. So if you have that on, you'll downshift and then the car will automatically rev match for you, which is a nice feature to have. And it works well in this car. Now, obviously this feature is only available with the manual transmission, which this car has. And you can see it here in the center, a six speed manual looks good right where you'd expect it, and I'll cover exactly how it shifts and feels when I get this car out on the road later. But also worth pointing out here in the center is the infotainment system. This is Nissan's latest infotainment. It's been in a few other cars. I recently reviewed the new Nissan Pathfinder with this system, and I went into a little bit more depth in that video. I'll link it below so you can check it out. But the basics are this system is fine. It's good enough. It works reasonably well, relatively responsive, pretty intuitive. And I do like the hard buttons at the base of this screen that allow you to go to different places without having to tap the screen. You have these always there and you can always rely on them. One interesting drawback of this infotainment system though is there's no home screen. Virtually all rivals have a home screen that'll show you like a few different panels at once. The weather, for example, the music you're listening to, and the navigation all in one. This car doesn't have that. You have to kind of choose a tab that you're on and then that's what you're seeing. So you can't see different views at once, nor do you have sort of a general overall home screen, which is kind of unusual. One cool feature though with this car and the map, if you have it go to a navigation destination, you can actually pull up the Google Street View of that destination from your car and you can kind of check it out on this screen before you arrive. That way you can see like what the parking situation looks like or exactly where you're supposed to pull in, that sort of thing, all in the center screen, which is actually a pretty cool idea that I wish more cars integrated. With that said, although that is a pretty cool feature, a big drawback to this infotainment screen, the camera is absolutely atrocious. This is the rear view camera. The resolution is terrible. It looks awful. This is clearly a carryover from the previous Z model, and it is nowhere near as good as most cameras used by rival cars. This car also doesn't have any additional camera angles, so there's no like surround view, 360 top down camera. You don't get any of that stuff. And in fact, the new Z is kind of lacking in general in driver aids. You do get adaptive cruise control, which is nice, and a lane departure warning system and a blind spot alert, but there's no driver assist, so no like automatic steering or anything like that.
something like that in this car. That's not that big of a deal. Most sports cars are pretty much like that, but worth pointing out, with the bad camera also comes sort of a lesser amount of driver aids in case you were hoping to have that. But anyway, beyond the tech in this interior, moving on to some other interesting quirks and features in here, one notable item is the cup holder situation. In the center console, you have a cup holder, as you can see, but if you pull back this center armrest, you will note a second cup holder appears, and you can also open the center armrest from there. Or you can pull the armrest forward, it becomes more of a usable armrest, and you can also open it from there. So it's kind of a clever trick to hide a second cup holder in case you don't need it under that center armrest lid. And speaking of hiding stuff, Nissan told me there is a 12 volt outlet in this car, but not where you'd expect. In the center stack, you have USB-A and USB-C, no 12 volt to be found. Instead, that's in the passenger footwell, so you can plug in a radar detector down there and then run the cord up to the side of the windshield on the passenger side so it won't get in the driver's way. Nissan told me they put it there intentionally for that purpose as evidence that they know their customers well. And as more evidence of this, Nissan also told me that the traction control off button is here to the left of the steering wheel and very prominent so you can turn off traction control. And in the same breath, while telling me that they know their customers well and so they have this button so prominent, they also reminded me that they don't have an electronic parking brake. There's still a manual pull-it-yourself parking brake and they mentioned that at the same time as the traction control button, which really does show how well Nissan knows their customers. Now, a couple of other things to point out in this interior. One, the three gauges at the top of the dashboard. This is sort of a heritage thing for Nissan. Other Z models have had it, and this one does too. And this time, the gauges are kind of interesting. On the left, you have a turbo boost gauge, since this car is turbocharged. In the center, you have a turbo speed gauge, which actually shows you the speed at which the turbine within the turbocharger is rotating, and that is a pretty cool idea. You don't see that in other cars, and it's neat to have. Unfortunately, the third gauge is kind of a cop-out. It's the battery voltmeter, which I think is kind of hilarious. You got your sport gauges that show you the turbo stuff and also your battery voltage. Nothing too performancy about that, but they wanted to have three actual useful gauges up here, and so they do. Also worth noting, talking about this interior, it's important to point out that a blue one is available. I don't mean a blue Z, which this is. I mean a blue interior, and I don't mean dark blue. I mean bright blue interior is offered if you want to. As you can see, it really is bright and blue and bright blue, and you could have that if you choose. Obviously, this interior is more restrained with sort of the standard black, but blue is offered along with a couple of other more traditional colors. Now, since I'm in this interior, it's worth pointing out some of the other items that the Z Performance model adds that the base Z Sport model doesn't get in this interior. One is that rev matching feature I showed you before. You can get a Z Sport with a manual transmission, but rev matching is not offered on that base model, only in the performance. And by the way, if you choose an automatic performance model, then instead of rev matching, your transmission upgrade is revised shift paddles, which are inspired by the ones in the Nissan GTR. The performance gets like more exciting GTR-ish shift paddles than what you get in the base model. Next up, another big upgrade in this interior for the performance compared to the standard sport is the seats. The performance has leather seats, as you can see here, and heated seats, which aren't in the base model, and you get power seats if you get the performance. These seats are power moved back and forward. The sport model still has manual operated seat. So some big seat upgrades in here. Another big upgrade for the performance is the center infotainment screen, 9-inch screen in the performance as opposed to an 8-inch screen in the base sport model. And it's worth pointing out the performance even has some more features in the infotainment screen, including a navigation system. The sport doesn't offer nav, but that is included in the performance, although most drivers won't find it really all that important anyway, since all Zs come standard with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But if you want a built-in navigation system, system, you got to get the performance. And one other performance benefit is the sound system. This has a Bose sound system, which is an upgrade over the performance model's standard unbranded sound system, so your music will sound nicer if you choose the performance. Now, it is worth pointing out that technically, when this car launches, it will offer a third trim level, which is called the Z Proto, and that's intended to commemorate the original prototype version of this car, which came out a few years ago, the Z Proto. But that version is limited to 240 units, all of which have already sold out. So it's not really available, but just in case you're curious about it, it starts around 
$3,000 before shipping, so like $54 with destination, and it includes some cool cosmetic upgrades compared to a performance model. For instance, you get bronze wheels if you get the Proto, and you get yellow brake calipers, which are kind of cool. The Proto also has a lot of different yellow accents in the interior, like yellow stitching, a yellow trim shift knob, yellow trim seats, that sort of thing, and the Proto models will have a special plaque identifying them as one of the 240 units of the Z Proto. But aside from that version, which is already sold out, you basically only have the Sport at 40 grand and the Performance at 50. And since I'm talking about pricing, let's talk Supra, which is obviously the thing that everybody is going to compare this car against. And I gotta say, on paper at least, it presents a pretty compelling alternative. I say that because, like I mentioned, the new Z starts at 40 grand before destination. So you figure maybe about 41, 41.5 with shipping. Well, the Supra starts at 44 with shipping, and that's for the base four-cylinder model, which only has 260 horsepower. The Z comes standard with this 400 horse twin turbo V6 for less money than a base Supra, which is pretty impressive. Now, if you upgrade to the Z Performance, starts around $50,000, like I said, figure 51, 52 is shipping. Well, the six cylinder Supra model starts around $53,000 with shipping. So even then, the Z Performance undercuts the six cylinder Supra, and the Z has more power once again 400 horses in the Z compared to 380 in the Supra. Now, the Supra is definitely nicer inside. I was just just in the Supra last week, and because of its BMW tie-in, it has a nicer interior, no question about it. It certainly has better tech and better materials. So the Z Performance and the Supra are going to be pretty close competitors. Some will choose the Z, save a little money, get a little power, but you could see people choosing the Supra instead to go for the nicer interior and not sacrifice too much for power or price. However, you got to assume that the base model Z has just killed the base model Supra. Why would anyone spend more for a Supra? get forced into an automatic transmission and lose 140 horsepower over this car, I strongly suspect it's just not going to happen. So bye-bye four-cylinder Supra, the new Z is here. But all of this, of course, is conjecture based on numbers and pricing and power figures on paper. The real question, of course, is how does it drive this compared to the Supra and overall? So with that in mind, those were the quirks and features of the new Nissan on Z. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the new Z. I have been very excited about this ever since they showed the prototype, which was a while ago. I don't remember, maybe a year and a half, two years. Uh, and here we are driving the new Z. This thing is long awaited, and on paper, it seems so desirable. I was just in a new Supra, um, also an amazing car, but it has some drawbacks, especially when it came out. It was automatic only, 330 horsepower. This car seems, and frankly, it looks a little weird. Whether or not you like it, it certainly splits opinion. This car seems to solve all those problems. It's got more power, it's got a manual transmission, and it looks really nice. I haven't really heard any complaints about the new Z styling, except for that front grille, which they have kind of made look a little bit more normal by adding the little gray rectangles to it. So let's talk about how this car drives. There are a few benefits and a few drawbacks, which I've noticed. Let's start with those benefits. One is the power. This car feels legitimately seriously quick. It is a great powertrain, and I say this as someone who actually really liked the old powertrain in the old car. Didn't like the old car all that much uh, for other reasons, primarily because it was so outdated, but I really did like that old V6. It was simple, it, it made sense, there was no forced induction that messed up the revving and made it like spotty. It, it just was an easy and good powertrain, and this car is even better. This twin turbo V6 is fantastic. You get power at the low end, you get power at the high end. It's a good engine in the Q60 and the Q50 Red Sport, but it feels like it belongs in this car for some reason. It really feels great. It's fast, it's exciting, and it really is fast and exciting at all RPMs as long as you're in the right gear. I'm gonna downshift a second here and take off. Woohoo! Oh, this car is just 
playing fast. Nissan says they don't quote a zero to 60 time. They leave that for the journalists, but I can tell you from a butt dyno perspective, this feels faster than the Supra. And then there's the handling. This car is very impressive. It is very quick to go around corners. It steals, steers well, very predictable steering, reasonably light, not incredibly like heavy, which I kind of prefer a heavier steering, but the steering is good. It's precise. And more importantly, the car handles well. It really corners quite well. It is flat. It feels fantastic in corners, very predictable, and it feels small in corners. This car is five inches longer than the outgoing car, Nissan told me, but it feels small, it feels tight, and it feels very tossable. And you get that feeling whenever you're, you're steering and handling the car and kind of pushing it. So where are the drawbacks with this car? There are two of them that I can tell um, that are pretty clear to me from driving the car. Number one is unquestionably the sound. The sound has been a characteristic benefit of these Nissan Z cars since 2003, with that big 3.5 liter engine that just sounded cool. They tuned the exhaust to make it sound exciting. Well, this car's lost that. And actually the sound, not only is it not great, but I don't even think it's all that good. It doesn't even sound like a performance car. When you ring it out, it sounds like you're revving up a, like a guy flooring it in a V6 Camry because he's mad in traffic. You know, that's kind of what it sounds like in this car. And it's disappointing. Uh, this car will definitely be ripe for tuners to put exhausts on. I have absolutely no doubt most people are gonna go that direction. And I think that's the right move. Unfortunately, the other drawback for this car is the manual transmission gear shift action situation. It's good, but it's not great. Nissan told me that they increased the weight of the shift knob by about 25% to make it heavier, which contributes to like a better feel when you're changing gears. But to me, it's still too light. It's also too rubbery, too notchy, just a little bit too vague going through the gears. I'm not a big fan of that, but that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the clutch, which feels very notchy, very springy. I don't like a springy clutch. I don't like one that's really pushing back against you, especially pushing back for parts part of the travel and then not as much for the remainder of the travel. It's just not really an ideal clutch pedal travel situation. I will say I've been driving this car around now for a couple of hours and I've gotten really used to the clutch and shift direction and it's it's not like bad and it's not problematic. When I first got in the car, I was a little disappointed, but I, over time I've gotten used to it. However, it still isn't great. It's not as good as some rivals are and it's not as good as it could be. Now, of course, I benchmark brands like Porsche and that sort of thing and you're not gonna quite get there on a Nissan, but it would be nice to do a little bit better than this. Um, just just a slightly better, more weighted gear lever with what feels a little bit tighter and a less springy clutch that kind of pushes back on your foot. But those are really my only complaints and they're kind of less important things to the main stuff, which is this car is fast and it handles well. That's what people are looking for sports cars. I also happen to like how this car looks. The technology is fine, it's okay. The interior materials are fine, they're okay. A lot of stuff borrowed from the old car, but whatever. This car is still fast, it's still fun, and most importantly, it's kind of a bargain. And I'm very curious to drive the manual Supra and see how that compares to this, but this car has some real benefits over that. More power, lower price, and frankly, I think it looks better. Um, starting off with a real Z advantage there uh, over the Supra. And so that's the new 2023 Nissan Z. This car has some great benefits. There's a lot to like here, including attractive styling, some nice new technology, a good driving experience, and that manual transmission. And I think this car is pretty clearly one of the more desirable, relatively affordable sports cars on the market. And now it's time to give the new Z a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 62 out of 100, which ties the Z with the latest six-cylinder Toyota Supra Automatic. There's a lot to like about the Z if you're an enthusiast. It handles well, it's really fast, it looks great, and in those areas, the Z easily beats out serious competition like the Supra, the BMW M240i, and others. The Z's weak points are in the daily categories, where technology and quality are fine, but not impressive, and of course, practicality suffers since it's a two-seater without huge cargo room. But if you want a great new sports car, at a reasonable price, the Z delivers surprisingly well.